this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next 10, 15, maybe longer minutes, we're going to take a look at the Great Society um, and the era of Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 1960s. Um, we're going to try to keep this short and simple for you folks out there. This isn't content for an AP or college course. We're just really trying to hit concepts and major vocabulary that you might see on a New York State Regents exam, a state exam, um, an entry-level high school exam at U.S. history level. So let's do that right now. Um, Lyndon Baines Johnson, or LBJ, was vice president of uh, JFK um, in the early 1960s. Um, basically, he was a former congressman from Texas. He was a big kind of forceful voice in the Senate, um, and he had a lot of power there. Um, so he was a really like, good legislative power broker. Um, and he was from the state of Texas, so electorally it made sense for JFK to pick a Southern Democrat to bring Texas into the 1960 electoral map as, as a Democratic state and um, help elect uh, JFK without Texas, uh, its President Nixon in 1960. So um, JFK was assassinated on November 22, 1963, and now we enter the era of Lyndon Johnson, who was president from November 22, 1963. Um, and he served one full term after gaining election or re-election, I guess you'd say election for the first time, in 1964 to 1968. Um, Lyndon Johnson is definitely going to be kind of FDR part two. That's kind of the thematic way I would explain the idea. If you remember when we taught the New Deal, we started with the concept of laissez-faire. And that laissez-faire practiced by Republicans of the 1920s or a hands-off business approach um, allowed big business to grow. And then during the Great Depression, we have FDR, who's kind of the doctor and having an active government, which is going to put its hands down around the problem. So Lyndon Johnson, or LBJ, I've always associated, and I would ask you to do the same thing, as being kind of an FDR part two. So if you see, like, presidential initials, put your hands down. Um, and usually it's a boom, boom. So FDR and LBJ will have an active government trying to solve social economic problems, as well as, boom, expanding the role and the size and the power of the federal government and the executive branch. So that's usually the level one question, is that LBJ took action so the federal government would solve problems. Um, the Great Society, or the War on Poverty, is the name of his program, so that would be synonymous with the New Deal the name of FDR's programs to solve the problems of the Great Depression. So let's take a look at the War on Poverty, the Great Society, and the different aspects of it which you're going to see on your exam through multiple choice and maybe in a thematic essay. So if we break it up, we'll take a look really quickly first at civil rights. Um, three big things, uh, four really, but number one would be without a doubt the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Um, kind of in the legacy of, of JFK, JFK kind of proposing some of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and Lyndon Baines Johnson even going further with it and really in a fundamental way using the Interstate Commerce Clause to really outlaw Jim Crow. So there'll be no more segregation through the federal level, the federal making the states um, pay attention to, uh, you know, federal law. Um, so core, Congress of Racial Equality and the Freedom Rides, um, the March on Washington, all of this kind of pressure from the, from the ground up led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So that's number one. Number two is voting rights. So, I mean, literally, the 1965 Voting Rights Act is going to give the federal government the ability to kind of monitor and regulate elections that are really a reserved power, a Tenth Amendment kind of gig. So not trusting the South, in a sense, with, the black, with its black voters it's black voters, boy that sounded awful, um, but nevertheless making sure that they're able to vote and they're not going to be using these antiquated fashions through you know, uh, political terrorism to get black people to stay home. Um, also the 24th Amendment was passed at the same time, the 24th Amendment being the outlaw or the constitutional banning of poll taxes, the idea of making somebody pay to vote. Last but not least, I would, I would hit the uh, 19... Um, 65 Immigration and uh, uh, Nat Nat Nationality Service Act, or the Immigration Act of 1965. 
um, you know, it, the idea that, that immigration shouldn't be based on location. What this is really going to do is it's really going to uh, kind of abolish the, the National Origins Act or, you know, where you come from as being the primary way that we determine whether or not you're going you're to enter the country. And now the Immigration and Nationality Act is going to basically uh, be skill-based. So we're going to increase numbers from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia. So it's not just a Western European thing. Um, we also have the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which specifically banned housing discrimination and extended constitutional protections to Native Americans that were living on reservations. So in the civil rights aspect, we see kind of an African American component, an immigration component, as well as um, um, a Native American component. So let's take a look now at the war on poverty itself and some of the mechanisms that the federal government used to try to solve the problem of poverty, which it did have some success. Obviously, it didn't abolish poverty, but if you look at statistics, um, statistically, after the war on poverty, we do see less Americans living in the lower rungs of poverty. Still, many millions of Americans will be poverty, um, you know, living in poverty, but not to the, to the dire extent that maybe existed afterwards. And it is going to lift some people into that lower middle class rung. Uh, number one is the uh, Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, which created the Office of Economic Opportunity. And basically what this was was kind of a community-led program that was funded through the federal government that provided education, job training, community development, and really kind of the idea of community action, of local communities solving their own poverty problems by creating programs that they know would help uh, you know, lift people out of, of poverty. Um, you also have um, the, the Jobs Corps, which was to market young people in order to get them jobs. The Volunteer in Service to America, a domestic version of the Peace Corps, which created basically uh, uh, um, uh, people that were able to go into lower income communities and help build schools and infrastructure and some of the, the things that you need to lift people out of uh, poverty. Head Start um, was also um, part of that kind of uh, poverty program. Uh, the food stamps program would be an easy example of direct aid to uh, poverty uh, struck in Americans for food. So you could spend that money on um, other things like uh, job skills or education in order to get yourself out of poverty. So that's kind of the poverty thing, the equal opportunity uh, program or the uh, EO, uh, EOE um, is going to be that local community based action group as well as federal programs like the food stamp program and Head Start, all designed to lift Americans out of poverty. Um, education is uh, a really important component of the Great Society and that comes with law, the Elementary and Secondary Educational Act of 1965. And what this basically did was it allotted federal money for the first time in a big way um, to uh, schools, universities, public institutions, created the teacher corps. Um, um, but basically it's funding now um, public schools. This is a state thing. So uh, the Great Society and the War on Poverty are going to try to equalize uh, America's public schools. So if you're going to an urban or a rural low-income school district, you're going to have federal money now to buy textbooks, to hire better teachers, and to lift people out of poverty. Remember, that's always the aim. The aim is always to lift people out of poverty. Now the big one. Um, this is the big boy, the one that's on the test most often in terms of multiple choice, and that would be Medicaid and Medicare. Um, basically, fundamentally, these are health insurance programs. So everybody um, that's poor and old, at least, will have access to some type of health insurance that's going to allow them to uh, live a basic existence. Medicaid, the way to remember it is, Medicaid is to aid the poor. Medicaid aid the poor. Um, a very basic program to give people um, the ability to go to a doctor, to uh, you know, get some basic uh, procedures done. Um, it's not high tech insurance, I mean, it's not going to pay for a lot, but it's going to get people hopefully, um, you know, into the doctor's office before they need catastrophic care, before they need their leg amputated or something that's going to cost millions of dollars. So Medicaid, aid for the poor, and Medicare, care for the old. Medicare is a, a buy-in program. Everybody contributes to Medicare, and when you're 65, you would enjoy the luxuries of um, having pretty good health insurance so you can take care of your, your, your needs, your physical needs. Um, and now um, with Bush extending it with the Prescription Act, it now pays for some prescription medicine as well. 
Uh, Medicare is today in the news as we see um, funding looks like it's going to run out in 10, 20 years, so that program won't be sustainable. So Democrats would argue that the program is of vital importance to um, the nation's health and that we should find ways to pay for it, where the GOP, the Paul Ryan plan, has advocated privatizing Medicare. So instead of getting health insurance, maybe you'll get a stipend or a voucher, and then you'd be able to purchase it on the private uh, market. But we can't get into health insurance. What are you doing, Mr. Hughes? That's crazy. Medicaid and Medicare, social engineering programs designed to give aid to the poor, health insurance aid, as well as care for the elderly when they, when they retire at the age of 65. Um, there are other parts of the, the Great Society. Um, you have the National Endowment for Arts, you have NPR, um, you have the Carnegie Institute, the Public Broadcasting Act, um, a lot of kind of cultural ideas. Um, the uh, JFK Center for Performing Arts was built during this time period. Really, the government putting some money into the arts. I guess the analogy would be for FDR would be like the WPA, the Worker Works Progress Administration, um, which paid people to do art. But now the federal government money is going to fund um, programs that are going to encourage people to get grants to be artists or to showcase their work or have public television so without commercials we can put on programs from... from uh, maybe a documentary standpoint or a little bit more of a less marketing standpoint, capitalistic standpoint. Um, transportation, we have the National Security Act, uh, I'm sorry, the Mass uh, Transportation Act of 1964. I think it was almost 300, 400 uh, million dollars for large scale urban renewal programs of subways, infrastructure again. Consumer Protection, the National Highway Safety Administration, the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, the Wholesome Meat Act, the Truth and Lending Act, a lot of consumer protection laws that were designed to try to get businesses to, uh, you know, do the right thing in terms of, you know, their consumers, the people that are buying their products. And we also have a whole ton of environmental legislation. Um, I could rattle off the uh, Endangered Species Prevention Act or the National Trail System, the Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Act, the Solid Waste Disposal Act, uh, all these acts that are really using federal government power in a new way in order to secure safety, a cleaner environment, a healthier population, one that's not maybe in poverty as much. Um, and really the liberal perspective on this is going to be equality of um, outcome that, you know, we, we don't need to all be equal, but we should have a basic level that everybody gets to. Health insurance, literacy, education, safety, environment, where um, a conservative standpoint would say it's uh, more, you know, of opportunity, economic equality of opportunity, that if everybody has the same chance, then we don't need these programs in order to lift people up. In fact, the um, I guess the criticism would be is that it could create a dependency, that people wouldn't have that initiative to go out and do it for themselves if they felt as though the federal government was going to do it um, for them. So um, all in all, you know, in a short term, yeah, the Great Society is going to have a short uh, an impact right away on the poverty level. And I, I, I really don't know what to say the effect is if you don't have Medicare today or you don't have Medicaid or Head Start or federal funding of programs or some of these great society programs that we really take for granted today. Um, I didn't even mention um, public housing, housing and urban development. Um, but again, the negative would be it creates dependency and it creates bureaucracy. It's expanded the federal, goal, uh, uh, the federal government beyond its constitutional limits. So there's kind of a constitutional argument as well. States would yell 10th Amendment, the federal government would yell Elastic Clause and Supremacy Clause. But we've been there and we've done that. So LBJ, the Great Society, again, you're looking at the 1960s, the War on Poverty, Civil Rights, Educational Stuff, Immigration Stuff, Direct Aid Stuff, Health Insurance Stuff, and uh, put your hands down. That's the concept, guys. So we hope you learned something. We hope you get the multiple choice right, that's for sure. And we hope that we see you again on YouTube or your favorite DVD that somebody gave you. Nevertheless, where attention goes, energy flows, and we're going to shut this bad boy down. Great Society is out.